Hello and welcome to Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Please subscribe and if you'd like to support this free service, please go to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland. Now, I'd like to talk about... I don't know what the, the correct wording would be. Um, the word relapse possibly might be correct, or yeah, we use the word relapse. It might not be the correct word. <laughs> I can change it later when I actually make the title. I suppose what I mean is I'm talking about is you know when you think that everything's fine you think that you've done everything that you need to do um, in order to change your life as far as maybe anxiety goes stress, panic attacks you think oh I'm not going to have them anymore and that's it Like you're cured or you've healed or you've completely overcome everything that you were suffering with that you were having problems with and then to out of the blue feel it or with stress or have an anxiety thing whether it's a panic attack or just increased anxiety because I, I have a tendency I feel it physically with stress and anxiety I'm not saying that in a way that aren't I unique but it's uh, I've been ill in the past where it was due to stress and I had no idea until you know I'd had lots of tests, medical tests, that told me that I was absolutely fine, physically. So what I'm talking about here is, I'm looking for a better word than relapse. Because when I, when I see, when I hear the word relapse, I think more of someone that's got drug, um, maybe drug dependency or alcohol dependency and they've managed to get off the drugs or the alcohol and they've been clean for a period of time and then they kind of have a blow out of the weekend or they have a, they kind of regress back to that behaviour for a short period of time. And that would be perhaps labelled as a relapse. Now in that situation, people could view it in different ways. Personally, you know, view it in their own perspective as in, oh, that's it, all the work I've done has been pointless. You know, um, I am a drug addict, I'll always be a drug addict and there's no point even trying to stop. That, I know people have had that thought, that have thought that way. And it's a shame to hear it, because it's not true. But they give themselves such a hard time for relapsing do they almost limit their own possibilities in life to move forward? So, but these other people might think, well, it was a relapse. It was a mistake or perhaps it was just something that they needed to do 
to remind themselves that that's not the kind of life that they want for themselves. Or it was just a mistake, or it was a choice. They made the choice to take the drugs, and then they've now made the choice not to. Now, I'm not going to focus on drugs or alcohol, because that's not what these podcasts are about. Other than drugs and alcohol are used by many people as a coping mechanism, self-medication, which is something that I did myself. And I'm not sure if I've really gone into that topic myself, I've really discussed it. But I've talked about drinking alcohol, and I used to drink excessively every day pretty much for years and years and years wasn't excessive to start with it was four cans of you know weak lager and then ended up being eight cans of strong lager not the strongest you can get but you know Stella at that time was one of the strongest sort of mainstream lagers that you could buy in this country you go up a little bit and you get to the tenants and the special brew. That's a different level. That's I could never drink that stuff. I think one can of that would just make me ill. Actually I don't think it, I've tried it and it did make me ill. Just it's not just not me. But and I've known a lot of people with alcohol issues. It was quite ironic. I'm just as an irony thing, life, I stopped drinking in 2004 for a whole year and I moved into a building and there was one, two, three, four, five, five other people living in that building with me. So it was a, a house share. Well, it wasn't a house share, it was just I was renting a room. And in that house, at the bottom of the house, there was a crack den. It got closed down by the police. It's literally, it was, I got on really well with him, to be fair, but that's what he did. He, he was a crack user, and which I said, I'm not judging anyone, but the place got, you know, that room got closed down and police signs everywhere and all that stuff, which is a bit weird. Next to him, there was an alcoholic, severe alcoholic. Again, another really nice bloke that I got on really well with. Upstairs on the second floor, there was another alcoholic, but I didn't really get to know him. Next to him was another al severe alcoholic who I was really good friends with. And he was extreme, extreme alcohol all, all day and all night kind of drinking. And then upstairs was me and another person. And the person next to me was ex an extreme alcoholic. But not when he moved in. Well he was, but he was he didn't drink when he moved in. And I think it's probably the worst place in the world that he could have moved into. Because he was on the wagon. He was refraining from drinking his choice to drink you know no one made him drink but he did and he lost everything because of it lost his job lost you know because of the alcohol and there I was trying to not drink for a whole year and I was surrounded by all these um really extreme alcoholics I say extreme because they were it was quite a weird situation to be in but I got on really well with not all of them really apart from one that I didn't really know so I've kind of seen to live in that lifestyle, seeing that lifestyle, I think what it gave me is 
an understanding that actually, or the ability to see the human being behind the illness, behind the addiction, because they were all nice people. You could say, well, how could the drug drug dealer be a nice person? Well, actually, he was. Very friendly to me. And I know that goes against... It goes against uh, people's idea of, you know, oh, he's, he, d- he does this, therefore he's got to be the devil. But actually, it doesn't always work out that way. Life isn't quite that simple. So before that and after that year, I used alcohol to self-medicate. I didn't realise I was doing it. I didn't realise that was the reason. If I felt high, like naturally high, I'd drink alcohol because it would bring me down a bit. It stabled me out. If I was really low, I'd drink alcohol because it was temporarily bring me up but of course alcohol is a depressant so it's not it's a depressant but not initially so I I love the way the medical professionals like to say well alcohol is a depressant almost as if everybody that drinks alcohol gets depressed when they drink it which is a complete lie Otherwise, there wouldn't be millions of people in my country, millions and millions of people every weekend going out drinking. And all the other millions that are drinking at birthday parties and Christmas and, you know, it's one of the biggest industries in the country. I would say the world, but there are a lot of parts of the world where alcohol is not consumed, so I can't be that general. But guaranteed, I'm sure in America, Canada, Australia, probably most parts of Europe, alcohol is a big industry, huge industry. So it's these generalizations of, oh oh yeah, it's a depressant. Well, yeah, but not, not in the way that it sounds. If you drink regularly, it's going to have a negative effect on your body and your mind. And every high has a low. The higher the high, the lower the low. Personally, I don't find alcohol, never have done, never found it to be a particularly high high. It's almost a nice buzz until I become slow and lethargic and not really functioning. And then if I, the more I drink, you know, if I get drunk, which I rarely get drunk, I'd wake up the next day, like most people, with a hangover, feeling crappy. So every high, it's like with drugs, you know, really um, strong drugs, illegal stuff that of course none of us are supposed to take, because it's illegal. But the higher the high, the lower the low. And I used to take illegal drugs during most of my life, actually, until it was mainly smoking, until I stopped smoking. So cigarettes and then uh, stuff to put in the cigarettes to make joints. I stopped doing that in 1999. Part of the reason which I may not have ever mentioned, is, and I didn't know anything, I didn't, I didn't connect it. You know, some things are so obvious that they're just practically impossible to connect. I started having anxiety, but I didn't know it was anxiety because I didn't know what anxiety was. And it sounds really ridiculous. I'm 
to me when I, when, I, when I say it myself, how can you not know what anxiety is? I didn't know. I knew that I'd been diagnosed with stress a few years earlier in 1995 because I'd had a whole year of feeling ill, uh, feel, bad stomach pains, but really bad. Felt ill every time I ate. I was bleeding out of one of my orifices. It was horrible. I had about 10 months of that and then diagnosed with stress after having medical tests and in the end they were even testing for cancer because they couldn't figure it out it must be something really wrong with me that's what they said and I wish they hadn't told me because I don't think a doctor should tell you that that they t you know, give you a blood test oh now we're testing for something really serious didn't really need that that uh, four week wait that I had from the blood test to the results. And I remember saying to myself when I was waiting for the results, before I was went into the hospital, please let it be clear and I'll never smoke another cigarette again. And it was clear. It was the first thing I did when I got out of there. I bummed a cigarette off someone. So, you know, it just shows uh, how grateful I was. But I was grateful, genuinely grateful. But at the same time, I was annoyed because I just had 10 months of being ill. Uh, I must have lost quite a bit of weight as well in the process. I couldn't eat without going to the toilet. And I had the humiliation of having to go to the doctors and have him look up me bum which I didn't want to happen. And once the doctor even said, yeah, perhaps you need to clean yourself before you come here. You know how, I mean, to be fair, I think I'd had to go to the toilet before when I was actually in the hospital. It's like I, I was constantly going to the toilet. I had no, no control over that. That was part of the problem. And I was, I didn't want anyone to be looking at my bum. Honestly, did not want that. It wasn't just looking either, you know, it was just, I did not want that. That was humiliating for me. And I was a young man as well. I was 24. So it wasn't something that I wanted to, I don't think there's any good time for it, but the... When the doctor said that to me, saying, oh, you need to clean yourself. That was among the most embarrassing things I've ever been told. And I started using a hose pipe. Not a hose pipe, it was a, like a shower connection thing. Squirting water up my bum, trying to clean myself, thinking I was dirty all the time. And it gave me this real obsessiveness. I was obsessed with it. And that continued for years until I managed to just, you know, kind of get, out, get over it, managed to, I guess I moved somewhere where I couldn't do it anymore, but So there's going back to the alcohol, I know I've kind of gone off topic a little bit, but I do tend to cover lots of different things in one session. That's the uncomfortable part of medical treatment and but it's so important not to put it off. Put don't ever put off going to the doctor. And if a doctor has to look up your bum, don't worry if your bum's dirty or not. It does not matter. It's a doctor's job. If a doctor don't like it, 
doctor can go and do something different. You know, it's. I'm sure that doctor, if I'd have been a, you know, 22 year old woman, and I just wanted to have my breast exam by him, I bet he wouldn't have complained. So, you know, you've got. Maybe that's a sexist thing to say, but it's probably realistic. I need to let it go. I hate him still. Still hate him. (laughs) But the relapse. And the anxiety, going back to the anxiety... I started having anxiety attacks. I didn't realise they were anxiety attacks. I was getting shortness of breath. Um, there was a couple of times when I was laughing and I couldn't stop laughing. Because I was just laughing at something. But then I started choking. It never happened to me in my entire life. The only reason it happened is if I had food in my mouth or something. But I never had food in my mouth. I was just laughing at something that I saw. I had to go outside and manage to calm myself down. Which I knew how to, because at that time, 90, yeah, 98, 99, I'd done a bit of hypnosis, learned some stuff, so I was managed to calm down a bit. Still didn't know anxiety. So I didn't know anything about anxiety. It wasn't something that was really spoken about. And I was one of those people that believed that, probably like many people, that there needs to be a cause. For someone to be sad, there needs to be a cause. For someone to cry, they need to have had someone say something really horrible to them. Or something really bad to have happened to them. But then if you meet someone that's going through depression or anxiety, well, human beings basically don't cry necessarily just because of what's happening. If someone's depressed, they might cry for no reason. But that's where we have to stop that. It's not no reason. See, I'm even correcting myself as I speak. That, that that language that maybe that I use, maybe other people use it. Talking about ourselves, oh, I'm crying for no reason. I'm anxious for no reason. It's almost like a put down, like we're putting ourselves down, criticizing ourselves. It's almost no wonder we maybe we relapse sometimes. If we're feeling crappy about ourselves when we're doing well, it kind of what's the point in doing well? You know? If we're talking horribly to ourselves, putting ourselves down, criticizing ourselves, when actually we're doing really well, we're doing we're being successful in our whether you want to call it a fight against anxiety, whatever you want to call it, the journey. And if we don't give ourselves credit, we don't actually acknowledge our successes and only notice the things that we're not particularly happy about things we're not particularly impressed with then I'm sure this part of us is thinking well you're not saying anything nice here so what's the point you know if you're in a relationship with someone and they're putting you down all the time there's going to come a time when you don't want to be with them. I think that's a fairly 
a fairly obvious statement to make. You might stay with them because you've got kids or because you're scared of being lonely or or perhaps the positives outweigh the negatives. But you're not going to want to spend time with them if they're being critical to you all the time or constantly. I said all the time, nothing's all the time, is it? But, you know, you might have a constant feeling of being criticised. So I've got a friend who corrects me on pronunciations, pronunciations of certain things sometimes, and it really pisses me off. Now, my natural reaction is to purposely mispronunciate things in that situation. So I'm, I'm trying not to do that. But what I noticed is now that I'm not doing, so that's what I used to do when I was younger. If someone picked me up and said, not physically picked me up, if they said, uh, that's, that's pronounced this, not the way you said it. My natural reaction would be to blast them <laughs> with as many mispronunciations or mispronunciations as I could from that moment onwards, just to annoy them. That, you know, it's a childish behaviour and I try not to do that stuff anymore. But I found myself with this person almost scared to say, to pronounce something, say something in case they jump on me and say, oh, you're pronouncing it wrong. Because that annoys, so it's, it's like quite a horrible feeling. So I might have to revert back to my old, my old behaviour or find a way to express that I don't care what they think. That, that could be another, I don't care how they pronounce it, that's how I pronounce it. It's the whole thing with David Bowie and David Bowie. Is it Bowie or is it Bowie? Who cares? I'll pronounce it how I want. You know... Jackie, Jacqueline Felix, who's just won an Oscar. So if you're gonna have a name spelt like that, don't expect people to pronounce it. Not everybody's gonna pronounce it correctly. Call yourself Bob or Steve, it's much easier. <laughs> so, um, again, I've gone, off, I've gone off script, if they knew there was a script. So you have these relapses. And I suppose for me, due to the mental health issues that I have regarding uh, the bipolar and the um, personality, the, I was gonna say the unhinged personality disorder, but emotionally unstable personality disorder with something else, I forget what it's called. I've got it written down somewhere. It's, I've got this tendency, I'm, I'm sharing this with you, so please don't, don't think it's necessary to do, to do with anxiety, but it's anxiety provoking for me this behavior and I think the anxiety is it's kind of the the wind the energy it's the wind <laughs> beneath my wings it's almost it seems to be the energy the uh, that f pushes me to do things sometimes and I've kind of mentioned this a couple of times the sabotage, the self-sabotage that I have and I'm really working on it, really, really trying to work on it but the biggest mistake I've made was um, it was in September last year and I was I got to know this lady and for about since the January of that year and we eventually 
went out. We eventually kind of dated. I really, really liked her. And I think she really, really liked me, I think. Again, there's no way of knowing, but I got this sense from kind of the way we were together. Plus, she invited me to go and have uh, dinner at her place the following weekend after she'd been to mine. She wanted to come see Andre. In fact, she actually called me Andre at one point, which was a bit weird. But anyway, um, and I said, yeah, I'll come and see you at the weekend. She was going to cook me a meal. Anyway, I sent her a text message. Well, I wrote a text message saying, I'm not ready for a relationship. Sorry about that. So text message is a crappy way to do it anyway, I know. Um, and you know, it was almost, almost kind of went on automatic. And I dared myself to press the send button. I dared myself. to completely ruin the beginnings of something that was potentially really beautiful and I dared myself and my finger almost did it automatically so I typed it out but pressed the press the button so to me you know the send button to me that is kind of a relapse because there's so much connected with that the absolute I was partly completely relieved when I sent it and that lasted for a very very short time and then I was just completely gutted couldn't believe you know there's so many benefits of that comes that would have come from being with her things I hadn't done for ages just being with someone and she was lovely well she is lovely and I've apologised but you know <laughs> didn't I even sent her I sent her flowers and a card at Christmas and she sent me a message saying thank you and everything but I blew it I blew it literally with that one text now I'm not not on here for therapeutic reasons to just tell you about my problems but I've done that in the past with a YouTube channel that I had that was really really popular I say really it was it was the most popular out of all the YouTube channels that I'd ever had previously and this was in 2000 and um, probably 2012 and I was getting 45,000 video views a month. For me, that was a huge amount, you know, compared to previous um, YouTube channels. I'd reached the half a million mark. So I'd reached 500,000 video views altogether. And some of my videos had over 100,000 views. And also the subs were about 3,000 subscribers and it was going up it was raising every single day it was getting more and more and more so I was getting maybe 30 subscribers a day added on the stats were going higher every day so I was I think I was on about 3,000 views a day which would have been I don't know what that would be a lot more than 45,000 so I was looking to do it was going really well and again I went to delete it delete the channel and I, I kind of dared myself to do it so this uh, self-sabotage kicked in because it was going really well it was going really well. I mean, I know it's not compared to like some of the YouTubers that are really, really popular, but for me, this is a, a channel that it would have reached. By now, I might have had like 10, 20, 30 million 
video views by now, maybe a hundred million. You know, it could all of it really was growing quite significantly, and that was eight years ago. And I got, I went through all the process of de deleting the YouTube channel, and all I had to do was press one button to confirm it, and I just dared myself. And I felt an almost euphoric feeling. It was like the, the self-sabotage part of me was rewarding me with this feeling. And I pressed the button. And that feeling reduced very quickly. And the next day I tried to get the YouTube channel back and I couldn't, couldn't save it, couldn't get it back. It was gone forever. I've done this with jobs, I've done it lots of times in the past. That's self-sabotage. And I didn't, I didn't class it as self-sabotage. This is quite a new, a new idea to me. Um, having been in therapy and the idea that I would do something to hurt myself. Why would I do that? Why would anybody do that? So maybe that's part of, you know, people that would drink after having not drunk for a year. Someone that would take drugs after having not done any drugs for a year. That's self-sabotage. And perhaps part of that is not enough kindness. Not enough kind feedback. You know, kind kindness that we're saying to ourselves well done things are going really well because we can't if we're going to rely on other people to tell us how well we're doing then there's a possibility we're not going to get enough positive feedback so perhaps we can do that ourselves to tell yourself constantly I don't mean like over and over again all day long for 24 hours a day, but constantly throughout the day, remind yourself how well you're doing. Maybe think back to how things used to be and how things are now and how, how much more improved you are, your life is, how you feel physically is, is better than it used to be. And keep reminding yourself that you're doing really well and you have done really well. And I think this might be one of the most important things that any of us can do is, and it goes back to being your own cheerleader, I'm just reminding myself of a previous recording, being your own cheerleader but not just saying, keep going, keep going, well done, but also, you know, kind of reflecting on what you've done, but realistically as well. So not kind of in a false way, uh, platitudes, oh, you've really done really well, me, 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 me. But actually, okay, how have I done well? Because there's evidence there is proof. So this isn't something that you just have to pretend. This is real. This is reality. You are doing well. And even when you feel the arm, even if you're feeling that, oh, this is, this is going really bad. Guaranteed you can think of other times when things have been a lot harder. It's not about dismissing how you're feeling. It's about reminding you that, firstly, you will overcome whatever you're going through right now. Every feeling changes. It has to, no choice, no option. Every single feeling changes. And also the whole thing which I like to say is, you deserve to be happy. 
and this is from a realistic perspective. I'm not interested in platitudes, and it might sound like platitudes, I realize that. It may well sound, maybe I am the platitude man, and that's all I do, is platitudes. But you know the reason why I don't just say it? You could say, well that's platitudes, but you know what, I explain it. I've explained what I mean when I say that. I explain what I mean when I say, be your own cheerleader. I don't just say, be your own cheerleader. Or, you deserve to be happy. Or, be kind to yourself. I don't just say the sentences and then run off. You know, just leave you with it. That's a platitude. Possibly. It doesn't mean it's a platitude because someone said it. But that could be misconstrued as a platitude or someone could class it as that. Find someone that spends half an hour to an hour explaining what they mean when they say it. That's what I do. And regardless of how boring it is, you get to realise that, oh, okay, it isn't a platitude. This is real. This is real. And I know that I've not met any of you that are listening to this. Not personally, in person met you. Unless, I mean, you may be sitting on a bus. And, you know, you might have met me. There might be people that have listened to this that do know me. But generally, and no one's ever told me that they do. But there's a connection and I do believe and I'm not really kind of really spiritual I'm not really any of that kind of stuff really but there's a connection between us there's a connection between you and the other people listening to this and that audience is growing there's an energy there I can't explain it because nobody can explain it. Not really, not scientifically. They can explain it from a spiritual perspective. Someone could explain it from a religious perspective. Perspective? Whatever the word is. From a scientific perspective, you could say we're all energy. And as far as us communicating and sending signals to each other well that's been proven that that can happen because that's what radio signals are if a radio signal can reach all the way out you know 100 miles or however you know or satellite ones with thousands of miles then in some ways we can touch each other it might not be as simple as hello how are you doing yeah are you all right yeah can you hear me yeah i can hear you a bit weird isn't it yeah it might not be as sort of obvious and simple as that but the amount of people that i've heard that have they've phoned someone up or they thought of someone and the person's phoned them or they've fought with someone and they've phoned them up to check how they are and that person really needed that phone call. So that's unexplainable. So I'm not here to try and explain stuff that's unexplainable. I don't care enough about it. I want to deal with facts. And I think I am when I say that you deserve to be happy that's a fact that you've helped other people in your life that's a fact that you would benefit from saying kind of things to yourself that's for me that's a fact you could say it's an opinion I'm going to say it's a fact because I don't think that anybody on the planet, there's no one that wouldn't benefit from having more kindness, showing themselves more kindness. 
saying nicer things to themselves. Who in the world would not benefit from that? It might not benefit the person financially, it might not benefit them uh, in lots of different ways, but it will benefit them. If I need so they feel better, so they feel more human, so they feel valued, like self valued. which I guess that's where self-esteem comes from. So I suppose the question would be, I know I started the, the thing talking about relapsing, but I suppose the, the main thing I really was interested in is what causes those relapses to occur. So that that's that's more of an interest I think uh, well to me at this moment that seems interesting and there's probably less chance of a relapse whether it's ill health physically mentally um, whatever um, situation it is there's less chance of that or there's less chance of that really having a huge um, negative impact in your life if you've got that inner cheerleader inside you, if you're remembering to say nice things to yourself, remembering to remind yourself of your successes. So that, that's kind of where I'm going with that one, with this. And the self-sabotage, to be, I would class that as a relapse. It comes onto the category, for me, in my brain, in my mind, um, because I don't, I'm not, I don't have an addiction to alcohol, I don't have an addiction to drugs, I do take medication, like uh, prescribed. Um, But a relapse in the sense of my own mental well-being. The self-sabotage really has an impact on my feelings of well-being. Not only that, but actually physically on my life. Because, I mean, the reality is... I haven't got this lady that I really liked. I'm not able to cuddle her or hug her or kiss her or be with her or talk to her due to my actions. One text. And who knows that the relationship might have gone nowhere. I don't know. But that, that's not the point. So... And you know, you notice I'm talking about myself. I can't talk about you. I can't talk about your own experiences because we all have different lives and different experiences, but there might be something that you relate to on the level of self sabotage or relapse. And the thing that really comes to my mind when I, th when I think of the word relapse is it's not the end. You know, it's kind of like if you're, if you're climbing out of a well, you know, if, you, if you've dropped into a well, you've slipped into the well, and you know that if you don't get found, that could be the end of your life, you know? You're not hurt, but there's no one around. It's just you in that big, deep well. And you've climbed up, and you've got your hand on the edge of the top, about to pull yourself up, and you slip, and you slip down back into the well. 
so that could be the equivalent of a relapse so does that mean you just oh you're going to stay down the well forever now even though you've already proved to yourself that you can get to the top of the well and you can get out safely and live the rest of your life would you just what would you do just sit down on the well floor I might sit down there for a little while if I'm honest to regroup you know to get me head back together I might sort of think oh that wasn't very pleasant all that work I put into climbing up that that well the side of the well to get out but I think most people I I guarantee most people would say ah, they wouldn't be sitting on the floor for very long they'd be back and I would say guaranteed they'd be up the wall of that well a heck of a lot quicker than they were last time and when they got to the top of the well they would be over that wall onto the ground safely so they were free from the well and they would walk and never ever go near that well again so I suppose that brings us to the end of this recording and as as per usual I have covered quite a few different things in this uh, recording so I hope some of it's been of use and that's the only reason I'm doing this this is it's an important thing for me to be doing and I hope I, I, I do get messages from people um, you can actually email me jasonnewland at hotmail.co.uk if you ever wish to uh, or I'm on Facebook you can join my Facebook page and tech, you know, message me there I get messages from people telling me that it's useful um, and I can even tell you actually I'll read you out just before I go I'll read you out a message that I received on I think it was yesterday or this morning I think Do, 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 do. So let me just read it to you and you can see what someone else has said as if it actually comes up everything goes so slowly when you, when you want it to when you want it to go quick no we're going to go slow ok this is from Cassia or Cassia. Hi Jason, thank you so much for your podcast. You've helped me so much. You've literally saved my life. I haven't listened to all of your works, but have listened to some of the ones for stress, anxiety and panic attacks and the bore you to sleep ones. Absolutely brilliant. So thank you Cassia if you listen to this. I realise I might be pronouncing your name wrong. Cassia, Cassia. But uh, thank you. So if messages like that actually make it worthwhile for me. So thank you very much. Remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy. So what can you do today that's nice? It doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to rent a space shuttle or anything like that and you know, fly around the moon just what would you like something that just gives you a bit of pleasure maybe you spend 10 minutes thinking about your successes the things that you've done really well the times when you've had some praise that you enjoyed getting and receiving you know maybe it's nice to have a little bit of time where you can celebrate yourself. Uh, 
anyway I'm going to go thank you very much for listening speak to you again tomorrow lots of love